ideas. It won't sound right. This is what the people will remember. Because I'm strong. Exactly. Now, and therefore, everything I said in this room, really now, wants turning round. What I said about a discredited populism in Condorcet in, in, in 1797, the 93, for instance, uh, I still want to say, but in quite different terms, to, to, to a man who... Good evening. This is Ideas. Tonight, the final talk in the series of 1973 Massey Lectures by Stafford Beer, called Designing Freedom. Well, I don't want... To, I'm sorry, but I don't... Um, I want to open this discussion now. Following the lecture by Dr. Beer, Sir Geoffrey Vickers, retired industrialist and author of Freedom in a Rocking Boat, will make a critical assessment of the implications of Stafford Beer's lectures. Tomorrow, Dr. Beer's rebuttal and comments from other members of the panel. Well, look, I mean, he's the producer, but... <laughs> the sixth and final lecture you'll hear now is called The Free Man in a Cybernetic World. It was revised by Dr. Beer after the recent events in Chile. And to explain briefly some of the confusion which this revision caused Sir Geoffrey and others on the panel who were able to read the new version only minutes before the panel commenced is Professor Luigi Bianchi of York University and the chairman of the panel. I have to uh, make a few prefatory remarks which are very crucial and very important. Uh, these lectures um, were written by Professor Beer while he was in Chile um, trying to help that government and that people uh, to in fact design their own freedom. Professor Beer left Chile before the military coup, which at that time uh, we all hoped wouldn't happen. In fact, it did happen, and this has led to some profound alteration in the text, not in the spirit which was already there, but in what is actually on the text. Um, Another dimension of the problem arises from the fact that Professor Vickers had received uh, the manuscript of the lectures uh, already in September, and he had prepared a very thoughtful answer to it with a variety of criticism and comments. A further revision of the lectures was accomplished only very recently uh, in the last chapter. This, unfortunately, had the effect of essentially putting uh, in a different context the comments that Sir Geoffrey had prepared. And I can fully understand his uh, embarrassment in uh, um, having to rely upon them and to change quickly uh, certain parameters of the situation. The reason being really especially that what is at stake here is the freedom of a whole people. And that's not a light matter that can uh, afford, um, can allow for a quick adjustments uh, of style or uh, minor modification of form. And so now, The Free Man in a Cybernetic World by Stafford Beer. Professor of Cybernetics, international consultant, prolific author in the fields of effective organization and management, and poet. Stafford Beer. The continuous process of liberating our minds from the programs implanted in our brains is a prerequisite of personal evolution. We can embark on that process of liberation only by constantly and consciously testing the ways in which our personal variety has been and is being constrained by the very things we tend to hold most dear. But freedom is not pure anarchy. We aren't free if we're dumped in the middle of the Sahara Desert, despite the absence of walls and bars on the non-existent windows. We are free when the doors of our intellectual suite of rooms are unlocked and we walk outside to breathe some new and fresher air. But we still need maps. The message of hope I have to deliver is that this is a possible manoeuvre, not only for individuals, many of whom listening to me now will have discovered these things for themselves, but for society itself. 
And here many people are not so optimistic as I find myself to be, because the task looks too great for them. As I said at the very beginning of these talks, a lot of people feel trapped. But I would like to make sure that you hear the following words, which form a conclusion drawn from his own cybernetic analysis of the societary condition by Sir Geoffrey Vickers. He says, The trap is a function of the nature of the trapped. Then I should go on to say that the failed society that I have depicted to you is not a malevolent society, not a cunning trap, for I agree with Vickers that the trappiness of the trap lies in our own nature, it may be nearer the mark to speak of a dinosaur society. By this epithet I mean to say that the trouble with our institutions is in their loss of the ability to respond in time, to learn in time, to adapt and to evolve. Like the dinosaurs, they cease to be viable systems. I've tried very hard to lay bare the mechanisms that appear to me to lead to this disaster because I think they can well be understood. What we understand, we can control. Control. There goes that word again. I can only hope that by now you will know how I am using it. When I say that any system is in control, I mean that it's ultra-stable, capable of adapting smoothly to unpredicted change. It has within its structure a proper deployment of requisite variety. Just now I said, but we shall still need maps. The societary maps we need are, in my view, the cybernetic maps that I have tried to set forth. And so you see why I've called this series Designing Freedom. The contradiction built into this title is the figure of speech called oxymoron. The freedom we embrace must yet be in control. That means that people must endorse the regulatory model at the heart of the viable system in which they partake at every level of recursion. Hitherto this could be done by underwriting a constitution or by declaring a belief in something called the democratic process. But things have changed. Constitutions, written or unwritten, turn out not to have requisite variety in a world gone crazy with its own proliferation of variety. And if the democratic process doesn't seize upon and use those disregarded tools of modern man, it will not itself be viable much longer then all of this becomes an appeal for scientific efficiency, which belongs to the word designing as providing a regulatory model to give requisite variety to human joy and fun, which belong to the word freedom. The clash and conflict of these conceptions produce in all of us, and not least me, a dissonance. The idea jars like any oxymoron. Then let us speedily reconnoitre this trap, which is a function of the nature of the trapped. There are two things wrong with the role of science in our society. One is its use as a tool of power wherever that is concentrated by economic forces. The other is its elite image. None of us wishes to be manipulated by power, and if science is the tool of power, to hell with it. None of us wishes to entrust our liberty to a man in a white laboratory coat armed with a computer and a roll of ballpoint pens in his pocket if he doesn't share in our humanity. The contrasting argument is just this, and I've used a lot of willpower in holding back the argument until this final lecture. Civilization is being dragged down by its own inefficiency. We can't feed the starving, we can't stop war, we are in a terrible muddle with education, transportation, the care of the sick and the old, institutions are failing, and often we feel unsafe in the streets of our own cities. All this is inefficient. Then it can't be correct to say that the only way to preserve liberty is to be so damned inefficient that freedom is not even threatened. We have to become efficient in order to solve our problems, and we have to accept the threat to freedom that this entails and handle it. Everything that man can do contains implicit threats. This is something written into the law of requisite variety as far as I can see. Then we have to be knowledgeable and we have to be untrapped. We have to find a way by which to turn science over to the people. If we can do that, the problem of elitism disappears. 
For surely I don't have to convince you that the man in the white laboratory coat is human after all and would rather use his computer to serve you than to blow the world apart. Then for God's sake, I use the phrase with care, let us create a societary system in which this kind of service is made even possible for him before it's too late. At the moment, the scientist himself is trapped by the way in which society employs him. What proportion of our scientists are employed in death rather than life, in exploitation rather than liberation? I tell you, most of them. But that is not their free choice. It's an output of a dynamic system having a particular organization. Remember the waves. And so my first conclusion to these lectures is, efficiency does not entail tyranny if we can get the system right. To do so is a top priority because some version of efficiency is required to save our dinosaur society. The next point I'd like to tackle also involves an oxymoron. You could call it unpredictive prophecy. It wouldn't surprise me if I sounded like a prophet or, to use a hideous neologism, a futurologist. Let me rid myself of any such pretension, because I don't believe that we can predict the future. I believe instead that we can describe the present with perspicuity, if we use the proper instruments, and that this same present constrains future variety. This is not the same thing, and I will take a few moments to explain. If I were to offer you a cigarette, what would happen? You might take it or decline it. You might deliver a eulogy about the excellence of tobacco. You might read me a lecture about lung cancer. If you're a director of a tobacco company, you might insist on giving me your packet. If you're the chairman of an anti-smoking lobby, you might punch me on the nose. For all I know, you might execute a war dance, and we could offer a prize for the best explanation as to why you might. The future, in short, is unpredictable because there is too much variety in the air. It's called freedom. On the other hand, I may have a model of you. I may have found out how you are and have a very good idea of what you will do. This fact doesn't constrain your freedom. It constrains the variety of my model of how you use it. If this distinction had been understood some time back in history, there would have been less confusion in what used to be very popular discussions of free will. Then let's extend the analysis to planning. If I set out to catch the 8.32 train tomorrow, then maybe you will find me on it. It would be absurd to say that if I were a free man, I might just as well be home in bed or flying the Atlantic. Planning is a variety attenuator. What is planned tends to come about, but often rather shakily, so that perhaps we made a loss when the whole idea was to make a profit. If so, variety is sneaked back in again when we thought we had rid ourselves of it. In either case, the act of planning does not rob us of free will. Then why is planning such a bad reputation? For it has. People talk about the planners in a very pejorative tone of voice. The reason surely is that our plans are not adaptive and the institutions charged with making them grind on with their implementation long after it's become obvious to everyone who will be affected that the plans are inappropriate. We are back to the unviability of the institution again. Institutions are stuck with their ponderous machinery while the newspapers reflect the public rage. Planning should be continuous and adaptive. Societary plans should continuously abort and be recast before they give birth to a monster. If this is true, there is no need to base them on the predictions that no one can correctly make in any case, but only on the analysis of an unfolding situation in which every decision constrains future variety. In that statement, the unpopular notion of planning is turned on its head and deserves to become popular again. Because it means that the future is something we use our freedom to determine, rather than something that is lurking out there and will happen to us unless we are mighty smart. We can make, rather than prophesy, the future. As to variety sneaking back in again, we can keep an eye on that. Again, this is hardly forecasting. It is an analysis of current patterns of variety so as to assess the probabilities that a system will next move to one state, indicated by a representative point, rather than another. 
This process has no bearing on the problem of freedom either. It is simply quantified business acumen. Science can do something about that through operations research. But I must add that I always laugh when I hear a businessman or a politician talk about a calculated risk because this invariably means that he is taking a risk that he cannot calculate. Then let me sum up my next key points, not as predictions at all, and therefore not as doom-laden, but as analyses which indicate firstly where things are wrong, and secondly how they could be put right. Civilization operates through a set of institutions with a particular organization. This organization appears to be an anachronism. It worked well enough in a more leisurely age, but now its relaxation times no longer match the rate of perturbation. Therefore, these systems are actually designed to have unstable outputs. There is evidence that the outputs really are unstable, a fact which tends to confirm the hypothesis. And there is no cybernetic regulation in the design to stop the instability feeding on itself to the point of catastrophe. Then we can see what to do. We can't grab hold of explosive variables and drag them down to Earth again. If we get tough and also expensive and reinforce the whole machinery, which is what we tend to do, we stand to lose our freedom. Moreover, and absurdly enough, this approach simply makes the machinery heading for catastrophe more efficiently catastrophic. What we do is to redesign the system itself so that its outputs are no longer unstable. To do this, we need much faster communications inside the machinery, and these are readily available. It means using telecommunications properly, in high variety, real-time, broadband circuits, available to all. To be available to all, they may very well need to be free of charge, like the air and the view, on which our humanity and survival also depend. I see this large expenditure as quite proportional to the threat we have to meet, and far less absurd than equivalent expenditures on which we needlessly but cheerfully embark and which it would be embarrassing to list. Next, we need to use the computer properly inside this network, not as a device to make silly mistakes, not as a calculator to do cheap sums expensively, and not as an invigilator of the people's free expression of themselves. Those proscriptions would knock out 95% of current applications and free computer power so that people can engage in their personal evolution by guiding their own learning and editing their own input. Very likely, computer power should be free of charge as well. Let's note that it becomes increasingly expensive to monitor charges for high-variety services. Each consumer absorbs these to a different degree and in a different pattern and it all has to be logged. If a toll road is opened so that the cost of building the road may be met by the toll, we shall need an organisation of requisite variety to monitor the use of the road, and we may well find that all of that costs more than the toll is raising. If that can happen in a relatively low variety system, the situation is far more ridiculous in the high variety systems that I adumbrate. So we should beware of precedence in these matters, there's a hallowed machinery built into all our institutions which knows how things are paid for from the public purse. Well, maybe all that too is out of date. If I lived in an isolated prairie community and discovered that no one in the capital was taking the question of my isolation seriously so that my telecommunication circuits and computer power would have to be paid for as a function of my distance from the city, I would form a local committee and propose to charge the city dweller on his holiday for looking at our local view. Given all this technology, we need new institutions for handling it, which brings me to summarize what I have said about freedom. So many people seem to think that to advance along these necessary paths might cost our liberty. To this I have replied that our personal freedom is not the absolute we take for granted. We are profoundly constrained by the limitations of our brains and by the inexorable attenuation of our input variety. That is how we are, and we ought not to start our thinking from a worldly-minded pretense. Secondly, I don't forecast or predict that such freedom, as is our natural right, will be imperiled. I say with passion that it is imperiled now, but we are too complacent to face up to this. 
We live in too cosy a world. This isn't the real world, uncomfortable and discomforting, where so many people are enslaved and dying. It is a variety attenuated model of the real world in which these stark horrors acquire that air of unreality which our television screens know well how to bestow. Therefore, the argument is that something must be done to redesign our institutions, boldly using science in that very cause. Society, in the form of its own institutions, public and private, is making a bold use of science now, not to redesign, but to reinforce itself in what may turn out to be its most oppressive aspects. Conspicuous consumption is an oppressive cause if it means robbing the third world. Science is behind this primarily because of the way telecommunications are used. Not only does television serve the cause of spurious growth, it has become little short of optical imperialism. Please contemplate those plays in which bandits are trying to overthrow the rightful king, only to be put down by clean-cut heroes sent in to help by the first world, from the point of view of men and women fighting dangerously for their liberation from a tyrannical dictatorship. I'd like to remake one of those plays using the same cast from the standpoint of the so-called bandits. Next, I draw attention to computer-driven systems that compile dossiers on the individual to rob him of his credit and his good name. That is oppression. If multinational companies are allowed to use science on a global scale to exploit the planet's dwindling finite resources for the benefit of the few in whom the power to do this is concentrated, then that will be oppressive. And if the might of military science is used, or even threatened to be used, against the democratic choice of any nation, then that is oppression indeed. This last example, unlike all the others, isn't new. But if we are going to pour so much science into that oppressive purpose, at least let us use science in the service of freedom too. All the oppressive uses of science that I have mentioned are in full deployment now. So science is not a neutral thing, as many scientists themselves try to believe. As for the public, I sometimes think they just hope that all this power implanted in our institutions will not hurt them if they are quiet as mice. But the mousetrap is loaded with cheese called growing prosperity, conspicuous consumption, and the destructive force stored in the wound up spring is the economic power that underwrites technocracy. Then we can lose our freedom, snap. The intuition that all this could be the case is there all right. It is built into that alienation of which I have spoken. But alienation leads to impotent rage, perhaps to violence. It is an excess of human variety that is blocked off and is explosive. Alienation of itself does not lead to new constructions. Nor are we led to new constructions simply by dismantling the bureaucracies, although I have advocated this. Besides, how does one do it? Requisite variety for running the world doesn't exist in any man's head full of 10,000 million badly programmed neurons. Requisite variety for running things properly exists with the people who generate the world's variety in the first place, and that means everyone. Whoever opts out of his or her regulatory role is robbing the total system of its power to be stable. Therefore, it is not for me to specify the content of the total regulatory model, but only to point to the need for it. But if this stricture applies to me, it also applies to you. The requisite variety for being messianic belongs only to the genuine messiah. I suggest that the first thing to note is that most of us have done what I just said we should not do. We have robbed society of regulatory variety by our passivity. The occasional democratic exercise of a vote is not a big enough variety amplifier. And besides, many of the most thoughtful people I know have given up voting anyway. This is on the grounds that to choose between alternatives to which one is indifferent does not increase regulatory variety at all. Then people will need to abandon their cynicism and become active. Their accepted course is to get into societary institutions and to try and change them. Again, many thoughtful people have given that up, 
because they perceive the effort as a losing battle. And if the analysis I offered of bureaucracy is correct, they are probably right, especially if the relaxation time hypothesis is correct as well. The only conclusion that I am able to draw is that we must start again. If that is not to result in anarchy, then the institutions themselves, including, of course, government, must take a hand. That would sound like the kiss of death to any good revolutionary. But I persist in that other hypothesis, that institutions, including government, operate with good intentions in good conscience. If you and I have understood the problems, why not they? Then suppose that groups of people draw together to consider the problems of society and what kind of society they want. I can't tell you the content of their deliberations, but the regulatory model will have to do with the control of variety attenuators and the provision of variety amplifiers at various levels of recursion, and it will have to do with the way in which science should be harnessed to these ends. I don't think that the problems of acquiring scientific tools are nearly as difficult as they sound, despite the expense. The greater problem is the alienation from science that has already set in and needs to be reversed. For I should be quite content if these groups of which I speak considered my views about the need for science to be quite wrong, so that they decided on a craft culture if they reckoned it would work, but only if they had free minds about it. Knowledge is a human possession, and that includes science, which is only ordered knowledge. Science makes bold use of experiment. I mean the crucial experiment, something that may fail and thereby falsify a theory. In attempting social advance, we work in an evolutionary fashion, testing the route with a toe all the way. Now, of course, I believe that this is much too slow. We don't have that much time. I advocate the bold experiment, but on condition that it's recognized to be just that. For here's a key thought. We can very well afford to pay ourselves for being wrong. To be wrong slashes variety. One thing the scientist knows full well is that, in experiments, it is just about as useful to be wrong as to be right. Both outcomes attenuate variety until the search homes onto the answer that we seek. So I would say that it would pay to set up experimental institutions, deliberately antithetic to the existing ones, and with their full support. The objection is immediate and clear. Just who, and just whose children, would be the guinea pigs? I tell you that the answer to this is a great many volunteers, for they could have the safeguards. They would design those like the experiments themselves. The reason why I feel so sure about this is that so many people are doing it already, without any permission, without any safeguards, and also without any call on funds to which I reckon they are entitled. For this is liberation. The rest of the design is simple. If science can do whatever can be exactly specified, and if people really do start specifying, then they will need recourse to science. It needs only a tiny team and no bureaucracy of any kind to make the links. The level of recursion must be got right, but it could easily be done. One team for every province, one in Ottawa, and that not to tell anybody anything at all, but to coordinate the efforts, to communicate, by videotape of course, the results. But I said enough. It's not for me to project my own imaginings upon the world, although it seems legitimate to try to release untapped and perhaps frustrated variety. These things can't be forced, but perhaps they can be freed. Why freed, you ask? Why don't they happen of their own accord if they're good? The answer lies, I think, in mass effect. Because to use science is expensive, the little group, however fervent, finds science difficult to command. When the movement is general, however, the cost is shared and becomes manageable. This is the reason for my little teams. And who should pay for those? Calm, well-intentioned institutions in good conscience. If one of your staff has a natural place in such a team, and his or her election by the social group would be a genuine honour, why not let go? Second the person, you have much to gain. And it's you, after all, you institutional man, who has tied up this person, perhaps he is yourself, with the high salary and the fringe benefits you pay, and robbed him of mobility. 
Couldn't you make this gesture to freedom and indeed survival? But when I speak of mass effect, I could point to no more potent example than that of a country acting through its democratically elected government that turns its whole self into an experimental society. And of course, I am citing Chile once again. In the third lecture, I discussed a system designed for economic regulation, but this was an almost incidental feature of the Chilean experiment. That began with agrarian and industrial reform, with making food and clothes available to the poor, and continued in a surge of enthusiasm for what even the main opposition party would refer to calmly as the Chilean process. It was the middle class who had to pay for this, they knew it and pulled a wry face. But they were mostly well-intentioned people in good conscience, and mostly they behaved decorously. I knew many who voted for Allende. They made up jokes about the shortages and queues and carried on. In the two years of my own work in Chile, I witnessed several attempts to pull the government down. One very serious attempt was made in October 1972. To this which produced high stress and great difficulties, the Chilean people responded the following March by turning out to the polls and increasing Allende's vote by an amazing 7%. But he was still a minority government, a fact which tied his hands, and now he looked as though he might succeed. It was time to halt the great experiment. As I see it, the rich world would not allow a poor country to use its freedom to design its freedom. The rich world cut off vital supplies, except for the armaments that eventually reduced La Moneda to a smoking shell. The rich world cut off vital credit so that there was no hard currency, except for the illegal flows of it that financed the contrived paralysis of the distribution system to justify the coup then let us not say, as we hear said, that Allende reduced his country to chaos and destroyed the economy. A system of world forces acting upon Chile reduced his economy to chaos and destroyed him. Allende understood that his country was losing its freedom in the oppressive grip of that external system, and when it said as much to the United Nations, the free world, as it likes to call itself, heard what he said, and waited until his own prophetic words were fulfilled. They will only drag me out of La Moneda in wooden pyjamas. At that point, it offered muted protests and set about recognizing the military junta. Thus is freedom lost, not by accident, but as the output of a system designed to curb liberty. My message is that we must redesign that system to produce freedom as an output. If we are inefficient about that on the grounds that scientific efficiency threatens liberty, then the institutional machinery that acts in our name will fail to prevent the spread of tyranny, war, torture, and oppression. We speak of the growth of prosperity, but the growth of those four things throughout the world today is yet more real. Let us use love and compassion. Let us use joy. Let us use knowledge. These qualities are in us, obscured though we may let them be, by the lethal strategies of our dinosaur society. And let us use that acquired and ordered knowledge, science. This too is in our heritage. If it has been seized by power, then seize it back. Expect it of statesmen and politicians who represent us that they should on our behalf, or demand a new breed of statesmen and politicians. Expect it of the educators that they should change the institutions of education not to train crazy apes, or start new schools and universities instead. Above all, let us all expect it of each other that we find ways to use the power of science in better cause. It is no more sensible to say that we can't because ordinary folk don't understand science, as it would be to say that we cannot sail a boat because we cannot understand the wind and the sea and the tide race. Men have always navigated those unfathomable waters. We can do it now.
Designing Freedom. Efficiency does not entail tyranny, writes Stafford Beer, if we can get the system right. To do so is a top priority, because some version of efficiency is required to save our dinosaur society. Freedom, he has argued in these lectures, is not lost by accident, but is the output of a system. To produce freedom as an output, we must redesign the system. It is the blueprint of this system that Stafford Beer has offered us in these lectures called Designing Freedom. How can we dismantle bureaucracy? How can we provide autonomy for people and communities? Where do we find the freedom to invent the future rather than maintaining our passive reliance on forecasting and futurology? <laughs> 